So we will uh, record this, and uh, as soon as we're able to add closed captioning, we will post this to the web so that if you'd like to come back and uh, listen or view it again, uh, or if other people would like to uh, view the content later, um, uh, they'll be able to do that. So it'll become a, a more of a permanent repository uh, for future reference if we get some really good gems of wisdom here this evening. Um, and let's see, uh, if uh, everyone doesn't mind, uh, during the presentations, it might be easier just to save a little bandwidth if we keep our video off. Uh, and then uh, once we go to Q&A, more than welcome to turn those uh, cameras on. We can see one another. It makes it a little bit easier to have a conversation. So with that, uh, I'll monitor the uh, chat box, uh, and then uh, I believe, uh, Ashley, you were going to go over, go first, correct? And I think I've made you a co-host. We would like to welcome every night, uh, everyone tonight to our first series in our small ruminant webinar on forage sampling and analysis. I am Ashley Olson, uh, along with Ryan Sterry. We will be talking first, and then later this evening, we will be hearing from Todd Taylor, our Sheep Pro Research Program Manager down at Arlington. Okay, I'm just gonna switch view here. There you go. Sorry about that, Ashley. Hopefully that shows up a little bit better now. Yeah, we are good. So we can kind of go through some of um, these slides were just what Jean had talked about earlier. Um, just a quick overview of Zoom, being able to find the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, along with your mute and unmute button and starting your video. Again, the chat feature is also down there um, if you look at the red arrow and that's where you can ask questions this evening. And also uh, the manage participant screen that is, you could click on to see to make sure that you're muted. Um, or sometimes we do some fun things where we tell you to raise your hand and things like that, but we won't be doing that tonight. We'll just be having a few polling questions that will come up later. And you can scroll through that one, Ryan. And then this is, uh, we just wanted to point out our new Livestock Topic Hub for uh, Division of Extension. And we just wanted to put this website up there. So when you get some time, you can go check it out. There's many different topics, events, news, and programs on that page. So and one thing, and this might be a little small print, um, it, we used to have more, you know, a beef page, a sheep page, different pages, they're all going to be housed on this one uh, livestock site now. And so um, I almost forgot about this. I look before we're starting, if you go under this programs button here, I actually can find the recordings from last year's small room in a Zoom uh, series. And um, so it's a good way for us to archive some of these meetings as well. So we'll just get right into what we're here to talk about tonight on forage sampling and analysis. So the first question that may come to mind is, why should we test our forages? And why should you test the forages on your farm? And why should we do that? Because it's the only way to know what you're working with nutrient-wise when you are feeding your sheep or goats or, or any animal for that matter. Hay is also the primary source of nutrients during the winter or the non-grazing season. We also want to test our forages so we know what our protein, fiber, and energy status is of the forage that we're feeding. We also need to know what supplementations are needed to complement the forage that we're feeding. And maybe at times there may not be any, um, but without knowing what we're actually feeding our animals, we don't know. So another reason to test. And also we can prioritize our feeding forage inventory based on our production stage, growth, 
and the weather. And also it can help you make better decisions for your nutrition program. All right, with that, we're just gonna to touch on real briefly uh, some of the tips and principles of taking a forage sample if you haven't done that before. So we have just a few pictures here uh, of the different tools we use. Uh, a lot of your local extension offices might have uh, these available to rent or, or borrow um, or might know where to track them down. Also a lot of your feed uh, co-ops and whatnot might have access to these as well. Uh, but on the left, uh, picture here, we have a hay forage probe uh, that's hand powered, hand crank handle on this. And this little wooden dull here uh, is to help uh, push the core sample out of this tube once you've collected it. Um, in the middle picture here, uh, we have a similar uh, hay forage probe uh, and we got more power uh, as Tim Taylor would say. This one uh, is powered by a hand drill. Um, if you're taking multiple samples, uh, this does become a little bit more efficient. Uh, and then on the right hand side here, we have a hay forage probe. Uh, don't run into these too often, but uh, I thought it would just be nice to show for comparison. This uh, is a probe here that uh, we can use for taking uh, haylage, corn silage samples. Uh, probably mo most commonly where we would use that is if you have uh, forage in a bag uh, and are gonna be sampling from the side of that bag. So when you're collecting your sample, most labs are going to ask you to try and get around a half pound of material minimum to submit uh, for the sample. Uh, and one thing when we say sample, really we're talking about taking multiple cores, multiple small different samples and combining them into one, what we call a sample uh, that gets tested for that lot of hay. So if you have um, you know, a similar set of bales that are first crop, grass hay, uh, sample multiple bales within that lot and make one sample, one composite sample for that type of hay, group by type of hay and how you're gonna feed it and whatnot. Um, one thing that we really do wanna emphasize though, it's really tempting just to go grab a, a fistful of hay and do it that way. Um, the challenge with doing that is a lot of times you grab that fistful and then you shake it and then all the good stuff is falling off the leaves and whatnot onto the ground and you're left with a handful of stems. And that's not really representative of what that hay sample uh, really is. Um, and so when we're out there in the field, uh, you can collect these in a Ziploc bag as you go. You might want to take a pail with you and throw a bunch of them in the pail, mix that together, uh, and then bag it up later. Here's a chart out of one of our extension publications uh, on how to collect forage samples and it goes through by bale type. Um, and so, you know, small square, large square round bales um, are gonna be the three main types you, you run across. And uh, the main thing is just trying to get representative sample. Uh, a lot of times on the square bales, if you can go in through the end, uh, that would be best. Uh, on round bales, we wanna go in through the curved side uh, of that bale. Um, and part of the reason for that being is if you think of a round bale as it's wrapping up, if you're going through the side, you're getting a little bit more representative of what's throughout that bale versus if you're going on the flat end, uh, you're just getting that one particular spot in the windrow uh, when that bale is uh, made. So here we have a couple pictures. This is a hand tool again, uh, going in on a small square bale. Uh, this is what uh, hopefully a picture better illustrates than what I was saying, um, going in through that curved side of a round bale if you're sampling round bales. And again, um, trying to emphasize, you know, a minimum 12 cores. Um, you, you could do more if you're ambitious, um, but they should be taken from random bales, random areas um, of similar types of hay. So we do want to emphasize that as well. It's just kind of thing of how you're going to group your hays together um, and sample that set of bales to make your sample. And there's one last thing on that. Uh, this applies to all bales, but especially round bales. Uh, you wanna push away any uh, twine. Um, this is a net wrapped bale. Uh, push that away before uh, taking that core sample. You don't wanna get that foreign material in there from the twine or net wrap. Uh, that can throw your results off from uh, what you would expect. 
So we know uh, using haylage, corn silage uh, isn't as common as sheep and goats, but it does happen and it's uh, available. And even uh, thinking about this in between uh, when we practiced and, and now you might have a neighbor or something that might be a source for this as well. It may not be right on your farm, but you still might run into a situation where uh, you might be purchasing this type of feed from a neighbor, for example. Um, so we do, we get samples from uh, forage pile or silo. They can be difficult to get an overall uh, sample um, when uh, tower silos are they're still used, but use much more. Uh, you know, we would talk about get a sample one day, freeze it, come back a few days later when you fed down a little bit further, grab another little mini sample uh, to try and get a better representation of the depth in that uh, silo, for example. But again, we want to take multiple samples, different areas, and do that composite sample again. And then in the rare case that you're working with a bunker or pile, or pile, excuse me. Uh, we really want you to keep safety in mind. Um, it's really tempting just to walk up to the edge, grab a fistful. Um, you might get away with that. Uh, you might not. Um, it's really unfortunate, but accidents can and have occurred uh, where people have done that. Silage comes toppling down from the top. Um, you could be injured or killed. So uh, if you're in that type of situation, use a skid steer or some other piece of equipment uh, that's going to protect you a little bit better. Grab a bucket full, take your sample out bucket fall just don't walk up to the to the face especially if you have a taller pile um, or bunker silo so with that i'm going to turn it back over to ms olson to talk a little bit more about uh filling out the information to submit a sample all right thanks ryan so we just quickly walked through how to pull a forage sample and we went over some of the tools and you might be thinking geez i don't have those tools available so you can always reach out to maybe your local feed store, feed co-op, they may have that available that you could borrow and pull the sample. Um, they could come out. Also many extension offices do have the equipment available that you can pull the sample and then be able to submit it yourself. And so what we're looking at right now is a sample of a submission form from a laboratory that is in the state. And we wanted to show this because there are so many different things that you can test a forage sample for. Uh, there are basics we look at, but I just wanted to show everyone we can test for molds, mycotoxins, different minerals. There's basic packages. There's, there's more advanced packages. Um, but if we go to the next slide, um, you'll really see what we want is fill out your information so they know who you are. And then next, your sample description. And that can be whatever you want it to be so you know what your sample is, whether it's first crop baled hay, or you could say hay in the shed, just so you know what it is that you're sampling. And then selecting the analysis that you want for probably what most of you may be doing to sample, doing the top sample, an NI, N9 NIR complete package is going to give you all the information that you need to know what your sample is and be able to work um, maybe with a consultant on, on what you should be feeding. So now that we've pulled the sample, we have the sample submission form. Now we have reading the results. So this is actually a sample that I sent in from my own farm and it was a third crop baleage sample. And um, as you can see here, it bring, goes over my moisture, my dry matter, and um, then we get down into your protein and fibers. And so your crude protein is one thing we really want to look for in this sample. It was 16.94. And then looking at our ADF and NDF, which is our acid detergent fiber, neutral detergent fibers, those are also important factors that we wanna be looking for when we're going to be looking at our forage analysis. And then moving on to the next slide and going down um, our results page, our starch and our fat levels, and then also our ash and basic minerals. And calcium and phosphorus play a big part in balancing rations for ruminants. And later on in the presentation, I will get more into that, but it's important to know what those levels are and then also the last thing that we'll see is our relative um, forage quality and our relative feed value. And so a lot of times when you see people selling hay or you may be purchasing hay, 
it says, oh, it had a relative feed value of 120 or 125. In this case, the forage has a relative feed value of right around 135. And one thing to note, besides what your sample results are, it also gives an average and then a median range of other samples that they have performed the analysis on, um, just to give you a better idea of where your sample may fall with other samples that they have received that are similar to that. And so just to go over a few key values that are important and what do they mean? So I talked about crude protein and crude protein is important all the time, but needs are relatively low towards weaning, but increase towards freshening. And then our energy, our total digestible nutrients, which is our TDN, also our net energy of maintenance or NEM that were on that sample sheet. Our needs will increase with colder weather, wet conditions, if we have ewes or does that are thin in poor body condition, and a lot of times our energy is more often a limiting factor when we're feeding a poor quality hay. Fiber, and I talked about that earlier on the sample, our NDF and ADF, and that's used to predict our dry matter intake of how much we're going to be feeding our animals. And as NDF tends to increase, our intake tends to decrease. And then last, the relative feed value uh, and relative forage quality. Like I said, it can be used a lot in pricing when we're selling hay or purchasing hay, but it's really not used at all when we're actually formulating a ration or diet for our animal. And then the one thing, uh, last thing I wanted to make sure is don't forget to always be offering fresh, free choice, clean water to our animals. That is the most important uh, nutrient that we can be offering. And so next we're going to just, Ryan's gonna talk about some extension resources that are available. And then we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into the nutrient analysis and feeding. All right, thanks Ashley. So we'll go through this part a little bit quicker. Uh, whenever we talk about forage quality, forage sampling, uh, it's pretty large, logical to start getting into some things on, well, how do we price hay and the inventory and all that fun stuff. Uh, so one thing that Extension puts out uh, about every other week uh, is a hay market report. This is a summary of hay auction uh, prices in the upper Midwest. Uh, it can be found at this website here. Uh, we can throw that link out there later if people uh, are, are looking for that. If we zoom in a little bit closer, this ties in perfectly with what Ashley was just talking about. Um, this relative feed value forage quality, it's great for indexing um, and it's used uh, right here for sorting out different lots by price at auctions. You're not gonna use that to balance a ration though. We just wanna be real clear on that. Um, and Ashley's gonna get more in depth on that later. Uh, but here we have um, 151 uh, feed value forage quality and up. Uh, and then it goes down into the different categories of uh, 125 to 150 and so and continues on down. Uh, this report's also really nice because it breaks it out by the type of bale, uh, small square, large square, large round. Um, this, it doesn't always hold true, but generally, and we can see this in the averages in this prime category here, small squares generally go for more. Um, there's a handling factor and all that stuff that goes with them. Uh, depending on what area you're in, it might be a little harder to come across them these days. Um, and then large squares kind of in the middle, large rounds, not always lower, but, um, but oftentimes they are. So this would be a typ pretty typical report uh, right here. And this also again shows uh, minimums and maximums. Um, so the average gives you an idea doesn't mean all hay selling for that though. Um, it is helpful sometimes to look at that minimum and maximum. And so with that, uh, talking about price, um, we want to talk a little bit about inventory as well. Uh, this is a perfect time of year. If you haven't done a hay inventory, do it now, uh, you still got time. Uh, most often, not always, but most often prices start to inch up as we get closer to spring. Supply and demand, supply is gonna get tighter. Uh, so if you think you might be short on hay, now's the time to start planning for that. Don't wait till you get into March um, and have to scramble a little bit harder to find it. Uh, so with that, you can do it 
pencil paper. Some people have Excel spreadsheets set up for this. Uh, there's commercial software that uh, can go really in depth. A lot of times this is tied to uh, maybe a nutrition program that a consultant is working with you on. Um, this isn't the only link, but this is one that uh, we use a lot. And so I just threw this in there as an example. Uh, Brian Holmes was a, an extension engineer. He's retired now, uh, but did a lot of stuff on uh, working with forages, inventories and whatnot. Uh, so he has a pretty uh, nice summary of how to make a feed inventory, looking at um, all sorts of different types of feed, dry feed, baled hay, uh, silages and whatnot. Um, and one last thing on that that I forgot to mention, um, when looking at that hay price summary, and Ashley's going to touch on this a little bit later, um, is just thinking about that prime hay. If you really don't need to be feeding prime hay, um, do we look at, is there a more economical hay we can find um, in some of those things? So that's just a starting part point to get into some of those discussions. So I'm gonna steal just a little bit of Todd's thunder. Uh, he's gonna talk more about this later, uh, but this is a sample feed inventory from what they use with the Arlington flock that uh, Todd's gonna to be talking more about later. You don't have to put all this information on there, but uh, I thought this was a nice summary, a nice illustration. Uh, so some of the main things, uh, just jot down, you know, type of hay you have, is it, you know, mix? Um, they have some straight alfalfa lots. They have a couple straight grass lots. Uh, but a lot of this is mixed hay. Um, you could also do this by cutting. What's your first crop? What's your second crop? Whatever works best for you, but just kind of a general description of it. Um, what type of bale is it? Is it you know big square, small square? Um, the round bales tend to mostly be wrapped uh, for baleage, uh, like the example Ashley was talking about. Uh, now we don't expect all of you to have all these different types. Uh, that's just what they have to deal with at Arlington and it's a nice illustration of what different uh, inventories might look like. Um, then we look at uh, weight, bale count, uh, just trying to get a total tons. One last thing before I turn it back over, um, and I thought this really illustrated it well, also the average bale weight. Um, we know it's not always convenient to get that, um, but if you can, um, it, you might be surprised. Um, we actually, uh, colleagues did an extension little field survey on this a few years ago asking what the farmer thought their bale weighed and then weighing the bale. Um, on average, people are about 100 pounds off in round bales from what they thought they weighed and what they actually weighed. Um, and you can see here in this top couple lines here, uh, big square. I mean, you think a big square is a big square. Well, there's actually a hundred pound difference in average weight uh, on these bales. So uh, a lot of times the extension staff on the call might uh, get a question. I got a four by four round bale, was it weight? People don't always like to hear it depends, but it kind of does depend. Uh, they do vary some, we can get you in the ballpark, but just realize that that's not spot on that um, there's a few factors that are gonna affect uh, that bale weight. So with that, we're gonna get a little bit more in depth and turn it back over to Ashley. Uh, once we get our feed sample back, we've done our inventory. How are we gonna start matching this up and plan for some winter feeding? Yeah, thanks Ryan. So what I have here, uh, is basically a chart that goes over daily nutrient requirements for a sheep. And some of you may be looking at these numbers and think, uh, well, maybe that's a little too uh, light a weight or too heavy a weight. Uh, this, this data came based off of from our National um, Forage uh, Research Council and then University of Arkansas. But this is to demonstrate what different needs are based on your stage of production. And so, as you can see, we're looking at a dry ewe that weighs 110 pounds, a dry ewe at 154 pounds, a ewe in her last trimester, a lactating ewe, a ewe that's flushing, and then a lamb that's growing. And if you look across the top, we have what are their required dry matter pound requirements. That's what the DM stands for. The pounds of crude protein that are needed uh, daily for that animal, the TDN pounds, which is the total digestible nutrients, our DE, which is our digestible energy needed per day, and then our calcium and phosphorus. And again, those two are very important when you're balancing rations, because if those are off, it can cause different metabolic um, issues when they, when they are getting ready to, to lamb or kid. 
And if we go to the next slide, I have the daily nutrient requirements for a dairy goat. And again, it's going over uh, dough dry at 110 pounds versus 150 pounds, and then so on in her last trimester, uh, lactating, flushing, and a kid that's growing. I do want to point out that this is specifically requirements for a dairy goat. The meat goats do have different daily nutrient requirements, but for the purposes of this evening, I just wanted to show the requirements for a dairy goat. And so um, some key components that we need to look for, and you can go to the next slide, Ryan. Um, we want to, what is our growth stage and our lactation? Also the number of lambs or kids that they could be carrying. And then also we want to make sure that we're balancing for the average nutrient requirements of your whole flock or herd while we're still watching for those outliers. Maybe, you know, do we have a lot of younger animals in there? Do we have a lot of older ones? Uh, are we overfeeding, underfeeding? And then also balancing for that crude protein, our energy, dry matter, and calcium and phosphorus. And one thing I want to note, um, we're not sure on here how many are, of you maybe are very familiar with ba balancing um, rations or diets. Uh, maybe this is all new to you. But when we are balancing diets, they are all balanced based off of dry matter, and which is okay, but we feed as fed. So I know for, for myself and, and others that call, they're like, I don't need to know about dry matter. How many pounds of feed is my you going to eat every day? And so we're going to walk through a sample here just based off of our forage sample that we pulled. We now saw nutrient requirements for our you or dough. So what does that mean? And how, what can I do with that sample? And so the example that I'm bringing up is if we have a you in her last trimester, does the forage sample that we pulled earlier contain enough crude protein needed to support that nutritional requirement? So if you remember, our sample was 16.94% crude protein. The requirement based off the previous table is 0 0.34 pounds of crude protein. And the dry matter intake that that you is expected to eat per day is 3.2 pounds. So if we take that 3.2 pounds of dry matter and multiply that by our 16.94% crude protein from our sample, we get a crude protein of 0 0.54 pounds. Now, just looking at this, uh, there's more than enough crude protein uh, to meet the nutrient requirement for crude protein based on that U in her last trimester. And so maybe we need to consider a poor quality forage in this case. And so she's not getting too much crude protein. Um, up for us to decide or working with our nutritionist where we would need to go. And so again, why forage sampling is important. And if we go to the next slide, okay, you told me that my you can eat 3.2 pounds of dry matter. What does that mean for that baleage sample that I have? How many pounds can she actually eat or will she be eating of that forage a day? So a basic simple math to calculate that would be taking our 3.2 pounds of dry matter that we expect that you to be able to eat divided by the dry matter of our forage sample, which was 74.87% would tell us that that you can eat 4.3 pounds of that baleage sample per day. So there is a difference, you know, in dry matter pounds versus as fed. And I just wanted to highlight that this evening to maybe be able to help you better understand your forage sample. Um, and what does it actually mean when we're actually feeding it real life to, to our you? Um, some other considerations that we need to think about when we're um, balancing our, our diets for our user goats. Um, really, it was to help raise awareness um, about forage sampling, 
but our diets may consist of other feedstuffs besides just hay or pasture or baleage, haylage. We're throwing a lot of different terms out here. And Todd's going to go over a lot of these here shortly when we're done. But there may be grain that you're feeding. It may be a grain mix. You may be feeding different byproducts, or you may be feeding a combination of these um, to your animals. And so this was just a quick run through and of nutrient um, sampling and analysis. And so with that, if there are any questions up to this point, uh, Ryan, myself and, and Todd are happy to take them. And then next up, we are going to have Todd Taylor, who is our sheep research program manager down at Arlington, uh, speak to us tonight about the different forage feeding systems that he currently uses and different forages he's feeding to the sheep down there. Thanks, Ashley. Does, you know, like I said, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and either type them into the chat or uh, uh, you know, unmute yourself and, and you know, somehow get our attention and we'll certainly uh, touch base on that. But uh, yes, as, as Ashley said, uh, you know, we kind of have a unique situation here in Arlington. I mean, we've got two buildings. Uh, currently, we are sitting at right at 325 head of total sheep on the place, counting lambs, rams, ewes, replacement ewe lambs. Uh, we lambed out 30 ewes in October, just weaned those lambs this morning. So if you hear some bellering in the background right outside my office are the lambs we weaned this morning, and they've been making noise all day. So, um, so we did wean, or wean those this morning. We've got 200 ewes on the dot due to lamb from January 15th or to about uh, April 1st. It's gonna be kind of sporadic through January, February, and uh, the end of February through March, we'll have about a 150 of those ewes lamb over about three week period. So we are down on numbers, um, but as you can see from my forage inventory that uh, Ryan shared with you a little bit ago, I've got lots of different types and kinds and actually a pretty good inventory to to get through the winter with and, and into the spring and summer. Um, you know, we do pay for our hay, don't get me wrong, don't think that uh, that we have to, we get all of, I mean, all of our feed is produced here on the station. Uh, all of our forages, all of our corn, all of our soybeans are produced right here on the, the Arlington Ag Research Station. Uh, however, we do pay for it. I mean, they don't give it to us free gratis anymore. Um, you know, we have to pay for it out of the, the sale of livestock or through research grant dollars and things like that. So we do pay. Uh, granted, we probably pay for the most part just a little bit above cost of production or right at the cost of production. Um, but as many of you understand, sometimes in a university operation, cost of production can actually be higher than it can be produced in, in, the, in the commercial market as well. So, uh, so we are paying for our hays, um, but it is a little different format than what uh, what you guys or what what uh, uh, most of you probably deal with. Um, at what we found over the years, I've been here for 20 years. I came here in 2001 and started this unit. I grew up in Wyoming where we didn't have to deal with near the moisture level and near the precipitation we get in Wisconsin. And I grew up feeding, you know, pretty much all straight dry alfalfa hay, uh, occasionally some grass hay. Uh, but for the most part, we got uh, uh, usually second, third, and sometimes some fourth crop baled hay, um, typically in really heavy small squares. I can remember as a kid picking up bales that weighed more than I do, or more than I did at that time. Shouldn't say do now, but um, you know, as a kid, it was it was a lot of bucking small bales. Uh, now, now here at, at Wisconsin, you know, I've learned to feed a lot of higher moisture feed stuff. And as as Ashley said, uh, you know, earlier. Uh, keep in mind that we can feed high moisture hay, but you got to balance your rations accordingly. There's some challenges to doing that. Number one, your dry matter is going to be lower, so you're going to feed more as fed. Uh, you know, if you're used to feeding, you know, 10% dry dry hay, 10% moisture dry hay, and you go to feeding 50% um, high moisture hay, you're going to have to increase your your dry matter intake uh, or your total feed feed it or as fed feed. So. Um, you know, I don't know if Ryan still got more pictures from from my my program here. It looks like it cut out on me, but the no, I just switch to view quick. But I can go back. Do you yeah. just tell me when you want to go back? Yeah, go ahead and go back, Ryan, and I can talk a little bit about it. Uh, the first picture you saw was our north barn. That's our lambing barn. Um, 
We used to feed a lot of small squares in that barn, but from a labor, labor saving standpoint, we started feeding large, large big squares and collapsible feeders like you see this, this one here. Uh, this happens to be right after our shearing school used being it turned out freshly shorn and out on a round bale. That was probably a wrapped alfalfa bale from a few years back. Um, we, we, like I said, when I first started feeding, it was, it was large squares of dry hay, mostly alfalfa. Um, the challenge we have with these big bale feeders is limiting our waste. And everybody knows that big bale feeders are less labor. You set a bale out, you wrap the bale with the feeder around the feeder, and the sheep have to eat, eat a bite to get to the next bite. Um, all of these big bale feeders are designed differently. Every one of them seems to have a different pattern of how it works. We settled on these feeders probably about 12, 15 years ago, and they are, they're built by, by and, you know, I'll just put a plug in for them for Ketchums in, in uh, uh, Illinois. Um, they work exceptionally well. You can see they're on concrete. I know most people probably don't have concrete to put them on, but we do have some concrete pads that we feed on. And, you know, we probably, oh, the old square dry bales that we used to get, we might lose 15%. I'm guessing, I haven't actually done it here recently, but I'm guessing these round bales were down to losing maybe 10% using, you know, five to 10% of the, of the bale weight that we lose between, you know, between feedings. And you feed big bales, you're going to have some waste, especially if you self feed them like this. Um, the other issue we have is in late gestation, you got ewes full of babies, you got ewes that are, are heavy, um, and they tend to like to still eat themselves fuller than full. And we do occasionally have some abdominal ruptures and we do occasionally have some vag vaginal prolapses we have, to, we have to deal with. And essentially that's because they're eating a lot more hay than what they really need. Um, in order to kind of combat that a little bit, we limit their access to these bales. So they're turned out usually at five o'clock in the morning and probably or, or six o'clock in the morning, something like that, and brought back in at, you know, four or five o'clock in the afternoon with a bucket of corn to bring them into the barn and shut the doors on them. Uh, so that's how we limit that. Um, this is a round wet or round wrapped bale of higher moisture alfalfa. Um, our wrapped bales usually run 35 to 45 percent moisture when they go into the wrapping, um, you know, and, and uh, it works pretty well for us. The challenge that we've had here at the station, it, when the reason we went to wrap bales is because we don't have to worry about the dry time quite as much on it. Um, we, we struggle here with some of our fields in the summertime, um, either drying down too fast or not having enough time, especially in June and, and sometimes in early July, we get enough rain that it, they have a hard time getting them dried down enough to put up good quality larger small square bales without spraying a heck of a lot of acid on them. So I switched to wrapped rounds and have had excellent luck with them ever since. Uh, one thing to keep in mind on, on big round bales that are wrapped is you need enough sheep to keep ahead of the spoilage. Once you start opening those bales, you can run into some mold. And as everybody knows with sheep and mold, you can run into listeria problems if you're not careful. And this is something I worried about when we went to this about 10 years ago. Uh, in 10 years of feeding wrapped round bales, we've had one U on the north side of the road ever show signs of listeria. So, uh, so we've had good luck with this. Um, my, my kids, my personal flock or the kids' personal flock actually went to feeding round wrapped bales here all oh, three or four years ago now and we hand feed it. So we take a bale and we set it down on the ground, unwrap it and just peel off what we need every day, throw it in for the use. We have no wastage that way. It works pretty good. Um, and we still have enough sheep to stay ahead of the, the spoilage. Uh, of course, you want to try to, you know, stay away from opening it if you can until the weather gets colder. Um, you know, we, we try to try to wait and open it when it starts freezing and, and staying cold in the winter time. So that works pretty good for us. So that's our north side. Um, we, we do, as you, as you looked at that inventory, we do put up a few small square bales of dry hay. Typically it's straight alfalfa. This year we, we held a couple of pastures back and cut them three crops this year. And we put up quite a bit of dry hay off of those three pastures. Um, so we've got some of our pasture uh, mix that's in the barn. Those small squares we typically just use in the lambing room and through the jugs and into the mixing pens. So those use are only on those dry small square bales for a few days. And then when they start, when they get to uh, the point of really lactating hard, uh, we move them to the south side. And I think Ryan's got a picture of our feeding system on the south side. Uh, we've got J-bunk feeders. Here we go. This is the J-bunk feeders we have on the south side. 
Our south barn has two 16 foot diameter by 60 foot stave silos that the station usually fills with predominantly straight alfalfa. Um, this year it's got second crop in one, or no, third crop in one silo and fourth crop in the other. We've tried a grass alfalfa mix, but our old antique silo unloaders don't, don't uh, uh, manage the grass very well. So we've gone back to a straight alfalfa chopped and in siled, usually put in there about, oh, I think this year the two silos, I just figured it out, average about 55% uh, moisture. So 45% dry matter, I think is what I figured here a little bit ago. Um, we feed those with a motorized feed cart once a day. Um, somewhere there's a, there's a motorized feed cart. Uh, we feed once a day with this motorized feed cart. Um, and, you know, on, on haylage, if you're feeding dry alfalfa hay, you know, our ewes usually get from four to five pounds of dry hay a day when they're lactating. So on haylage, with being 15% moisture, we're going to feed twice that. The ewes are eating eight to 10 pounds of haylage a day. Uh, it is high quality feed, probably higher quality than I need. Um, but as I said, it's, it's kind of the way we're set up in the North Barn. Uh, there's been years that I feel like our ewes probably uh, wean off the lambs, you know, wean the lambs off decent, but the ewes are probably fatter than they were when they went in because of the feed that we're feeding them. Uh, but we don't have to feed a lot of energy supplements because of it. Um, and it, it, like I said, it works good for us. Uh, we do have to watch the mold on this side of the road too. Uh, here I was bragging to Ryan and Ashley a couple of days ago about how we <coughs> never have had any listeria on the south side and I had the vets out last Friday and lost one ewe and had another one we treated and both of them were showing early signs of, or well, one of them was beyond uh, saving. So uh, late signs of listeria and the other one we did get her to recover but they were both showing some signs of listeria. We've got one silo that's got a little bit of issue with the walls that need to be relined and we're running into some issues with some pockets of mold that we have to be careful of and watch and make sure we dis di uh, uh, discard that, that moldy feed if we catch it. So apparently the ewes caught it before we did on that one. But uh, uh, you know, this time of year, we're feeding out of both silos at the same time. We're probably taking a, oh, six inches to a foot out of each silo every day. So. Um, so we're staying ahead of the, the feed and feed quality staying pretty good. So, so that's our system. Um, some of the challenges and some of the, uh, you know, nuances that, that we go through, as I said, I really like feeding the higher moisture forages now. I wasn't sold on it when I first started, but it's worked really well for us. Our you stay in good shape? And as I said, we were having such good luck with it here. Uh, we went ahead and started buying wrap ground bill my kids this flock as well and i've had good luck there also so um ryan ashley anything that i failed to to cover or talk about and then any questions that we want it looks like there's one in the chat oh never mind that's ashley's 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 note to ask questions sorry about that so well, if nobody else says i got two for you todd okay not that i have to go first but um just tying together a little bit about what Ashley was talking about and then when you're talking about your different types of feeders and whatnot. Um, and if you're experienced, you already know this, but for maybe for newer people, they might have some questions when Ashley was talking about, you know, her you that could eat 4.3 pounds of hay a day. That's how much that you could eat. It's not counting what was on the ground around that yep. one bale feeder picture, which was a really good picture for a bale feeder. <laughs> um, so you got to factor in whatever that percent is above and beyond you know, and I don't know if you have any tips or suggestions or just kind of reminders on um, you, you leave sheep and goats to their own demise. They will waste hay. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, just just trying to, you know, either either experimenting on your own with different styles of feeder or talk to other producers that have used them. And we had some big uh, uh, what do I want to say cradle feeders or overhead feeders when I first got here. Uh, that had been purchased, you know, prior years to me, um, you know, big cradle feeders that you set the bale in and the sheep actually come underneath them and, and eat from the bottom. And there was two problems with that. Number one, you know, I'm a wool guy from out West. I like my fleeces and I like them to stay clean. Uh, if you know any, you know, if you know anything about sheep and eating and overhead feeders, they're going to be full of, of hay chaff right down the middle of their back. And some of the highest quality hay you're feeding them is going to be down the middle of their back. So that wasn't a good plan. Plus some of our lower quality feeds that we were feeding, they were wasting so much of it and tromping on so much of it. We were probably losing better than half the bale 
just to waste, just because they were picky and weren't, weren't eating it and could walk on it and actually build it up underneath where they wouldn't have to, you know, reach up so high to eat the next bite. So we moved away from those pretty quickly and went to these collapsible feeders where they're a whole lot, whole lot cleaner and a whole lot neater and, and, and have had really good luck with them. Premier makes a pretty nice collapsible feeder. Um, some of the other sheep companies that have gone away from the cradle feeders and most of them have gone to the collapsibles now where they, you know, have, have a fit a nice, the ones that we have fit two um, large square bales or two um, middle sized or medium sized round bales pretty easily. If you can see those pictures that I showed you, uh, most of those started with, with two bales in the feeder and they just continue to collapse. And the thing I like about them is, is the way they're designed uh, those sheep have to get down on the bottom and, and, and eat and clean it up before that feeder will slide forward. So uh, how do you measure how much you're, you're, you're wasting, you know, without making it, you know, making it a clean environment to start with, and then, you know, put your bale in, uh, try to scoop it up and, <laughs> and pile it and, you know, make an estimate. I mean, without, you're going to have manure in there and added dirt and stuff like that, that the sheep are going to drop on it as well. But you should be able to get some estimate on on how much you're wasting and and then trying to change your feeder design to where you know they have to eat the next bite before they you know before the feeder will move in and and the ones that we've got like i said those uprights are only i think they're two inches wide by four inches high most of those openings so it's just big enough for them to get their their noses in in fact if we have bad bales and they really get aggressive on them they'll rub sores on the sides of their faces from where they're, they're reaching in there and trying to push that feeder in to get to the next bite. So, um, so you know, it, it works good for us. We've had good luck with it, um, you know, and, and on this side, on the, on the south side and the J bunks, the biggest issue we have with the J bunk and the cable is the lambs crawling in and out of the bunks. But, um, but you know, they, as far as wastage and cleaning and things up, these J bunks work exceptionally well for us, so. Um, so is that kind of what you're trying to get at, Ryan, there is how to, how to measure, you know, waste, and that's a hard one to measure, but I mean, you can, you can visu visually see it most of the time if you're, and the higher your, higher quality your hay is, you know, the less waste you're going to have. So if you saw in my inventory, we've got a bunch of oat hay bales this year that are wrapped. They were high moisture. I just got the, the results back on the forage test. And I'm a little nervous about it because it's pretty low in protein, pretty low in relative feed value, um, but it is wrapped. It should have fermented a little bit. I have not opened any of it yet. Um, I'm gonna wait and give these ewes that we weaned lambs off of about two weeks to dry up. And then I'm gonna probably try it on them first and see how well they eat it and how they do on it. My problem is, is everything's over here on the good quality haylage right now. When I move them to the north barn and put them on those wrapped round bales, I really don't want to drop back the quality of the forage that I'm feeding them as we go into late gestation and the, you know, the beginning of lactation. So I'm probably going to use some, um, some higher quality wrapped hay that I have kind of, kind of uh, what do I want to say, stockpiled out there that uh, hopefully will get me through the late gestation and early lactation before they come back over to this side of the road and get fed the alfalfa on lactation. So. Then one last thing, and then I might have to, I'm trying to see the chat or it's a little different when I got the slides up. Um, yeah, you said something to us the other day, Todd, um, since you have so many different types of forages, if you have to change your ration, are you bouncing around between different types of forage or are you adjusting your grain ration around what type of hay you have? <laughs> yes, <laughs> to all of the above. Um, Probably the, the, I mean, the thing that we're trying to do the most is, is we will adjust our, our grains, our concentrate supplementation based around the quality of the forage. Um, if, as you see, as I talked about on this alfalfa haylage on the south side, uh, quite honestly, looking at the reports, they don't need any grain at all. I mean, they have got plenty of energy in that. Um, protein is up around 22% on this haylage. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they really don't need much grain at all. I do offer just a little bit of corn, especially during lactation. Um, you know, we, we usually feed about a, a pound of corn per head per day, uh, you know, three quarters to a pound of corn per head per day. 
um, mostly just because of the amount of haylage. That way we can back down on how much haylage they're getting uh, and they're not filling themselves up quite so, so much with that heavy feed. When we go to the north side with these lower quality hays on, that are wrapped, um, you know, I will balance it for protein first. And if I need to bump the protein, I've got a, a protein supplement that I can use. The feed mill makes me a protein pellet um, that I will, I will add a little bit of that to their grain supplement in the evenings when we bring them in at night, uh, just to give them a little added protein. Uh, energy is usually not an issue with, with the wrapped hays or the haylage out of the silos. Um, and, and honestly, the alfalfa's protein probably isn't an issue either. Um, but if we go to the lower quality, like the, the baleage, I mean, the uh, oatlage, yes, we'll have, to, we'll have to increase the protein and energy, at least the protein on that for sure. But like I said, I'm probably not going to use that on pregnant or lactating ewes. I'm going to wait and use it either as a, a maintenance ration when I have trouble with, with summer pasture. I could use it in early gestation when we come off of pasture. It would work fine for that. Um, but I'm a little hesitant to use that oatlage. Uh, for late gestation and early lactation, just because of the the lower feed. Now it would be it'll be good for dry up feed to dry the ewes up as we go into those last couple of weeks and before weaning, we can feed a little bit of it. It's like it's you know like feeding straw essentially. You know a lot of people feed straw those last couple of weeks to dry up their ewes. So, um, another question we have, Todd, <laughs> with corn. What type do you prefer, cracked, whole, et cetera? I have gone to whole shell corn for sheep. Um, one advantage with sheep, and there's a lot of research been done over this years, over this, over the years, uh, sheep will process corn on their own. They don't need it cracked. In fact, um, the cracking process of them doing it actually slows it down going through the rumen just a little bit. Uh, so we feed whole shell corn. Um, our, our finisher ration that we used for, for finishing lambs out was whole shell corn, whole oats, and a protein pellet mixed together. And then our ewe ration, you know, we feed the haylage and whole shell corn and just let those sheep process it themselves. It just takes one step out of it. Uh, we've never had any problems with it. Um, you know, I've, I've always had good luck. So just from a labor saving, saving standpoint, from a cost saving standpoint, if your mill will sell it to you whole, you know, and, and give you a little bit of break on it. There's no problem with feeding whole shell corn to sheep. Do we have any other questions? You can feel free to turn on your camera, unmute yourself to ask. Um, when we are towards the end, we do have a short uh, poll for everybody. You will be receiving um, a follow-up email um, that will have the, you know, recording and saying thank you for attending this presentation this evening. Um, if that helps, then you can um, go back and watch at any time. I do think it's interesting, Todd, the different forages that you're feeding, haylage, oatlage. Um, I personally have goats and they do not get that. They, they simply get a dry hay mix uh, and, and a little bit of grain. So I might. Part, part of it is, and part of the reason I get so much difference is, is of course the dairy is, is the main operation here on the station and they kind of get first choice and whatever they don't necessarily find room for or find a need for. Um, I usually get asked if I can use it and it makes its way down here and I figure out either a way to use it or it sits here till somebody else comes along and wants it for a project. The oatledge is, is new to me. I've never fed oatledge. What it was, was they revamped some pastures over at the beef unit and put oats in as a cover crop to establish the forage coming up underneath. They harvested and rather than just throwing it away, they asked me if I thought I could use it. I said, well, I don't know. I've never fed it, but I guess I'll try it if we're going to wrap it. So like I said, we'll see how it goes. I, I haven't, like I said, I haven't, haven't opened it yet. I haven't got into it yet. Um, I don't know what it's going to be like. My biggest concern is they're going to waste better than a third of it, probably just because it's, you know, because it's, it's stemmier, the, the, you know, it's like feeding straw with oat heads on it, essentially is what it's going to be, be like. So I'm guessing they'll eat those oat heads pretty good. We'll see how the straw fermented itself and whether or not they eat it or not. Like I said, I've never fed it. 
um, we'll see what happens. So I will keep you posted on that. Let's put it that way. We have another question. What about feeding cotton seed for energy? Um, we used to feed a lot of cotton seed when I was at Texas A&M. Of course, it's more plentiful and more readily available and much cheaper down there than it is in this country. Um, it's, it's more of a the cotton seed or cotton seed meal is more of a protein supplement, but can be a, you know, has a little added energy as well. Um, in this country, what a lot of people are using is soy hulls. Um, and if you look at, you know, go to SDSU's website or, or visit with those guys out there, they've done a lot of research on using soy hulls for a, a fiber and, and energy source and keeping uh, as a maintenance ration for rams and things like that through the winter. It works pretty well. Um, and it's much cheaper in this country than, so, than uh, cottonseed is. But yeah, there's nothing wrong with using cottonseed if it's available in your area. Um, it's very, very similar to soybean actually. Thank you. And, and Jean also put a, um, in the chat box as well, uh, complimenting what Todd said, as well as um, there can be some issues with um, gassy pole. Yes, you, yes. And then um, another question or thought that came through, they said, I just made the Premier One feeder according to their instructions. The base was treated wood that the hay sits in. Is that a problem? No, um, actually we're, and I, I should have sent some pictures of this to Ryan as well. Um, we use a lot of the, the Premier, um, I know what you're talking about is it if I don't know if it's a double sided or to the single sided um, my son's uh, revamped or, or uh, redesigned an old dairy barn for our lambing barn and put a fence line premier feeder in there or a single sided in there and it's treated lumber on the bottom and we have not had any problems with it and then we also remodeled an old corn crib to be our summer show barn and put um, a little bit of a modified version of the premier feeders double sided in it and you know like it yeah though the, they're treated lumber and we haven't had any problems um what did gene say yeah most preservatives on the wood on the wood should not leach into the feed yeah and and our honestly i think with them treated the sheep don't seem to chew on them quite as bad as if they're just a, a regular pine board sometimes they i don't think they like the taste of those those uh, substances. So we, we've had pretty good luck with, with using the treated lumber in those, are, in those uh, feeders. Um, another comment that now that we can all see the, see the chat here again, that um, a person said, we fed Oatledge this year to their youth it up pretty well. Good. Like I said, it'll be an experiment that I'm, I'm interested to see if I can figure out how it works. So Any other questions or thoughts while we're all here? This is the end of our presentation, I should say too, for the evening, so. I'm going to launch the poll while we're taking a few yeah. more questions. We do have um, another um, person said that they have a Premier One hay feeder and they think they get a lot more waste with it than, than we're talking about. The holes are four by six. Uh, Gil, is that the, the collapsible ones, the, the, that go around you stand up and go around the, um, round bale? I'm assuming that's not the, the fence line or that's not the, the wooden, um, individual fee. I'm, I know, I think I know what you're talking about and, and yeah, uh, again, probably what you're dealing with is you may have a, a hay that's just not quite as appetizing to them. Um, I've never used the premier feeders that, you know, that, that fit together or they're, they usually come in a five panels that, that set up around the bale around, you set a round bale on its, on its end and build around it uh, or square bales, same way. And they kind of eat. Uh, most of those have got a, a hole where the sheep can actually stick their head through and, and eat. And yeah, I, I don't know. Premier's made some improvements to those feeders over the years, I know. Um, but I, I, I've never used them, so I don't know what the issues are with them. Um, I just really like these collapsibles that we've got. Um, you know, we've had them for about 15 years. 
other than some welding on some of the uprights and fixing them now and then, you know, they've, they've worked extre extremely well for us and, and have limited our waste quite a bit, but, uh, but I know other feeders are not quite as, as easily to, as easy to use for that, you know, for that reason, they do pull out a lot more. This, this is the double sided one out of four by uh, out of two by four panels. Like there's four of them, you know, it's about what, eight feet long. Mm -hmm. uh, are you are you buying those premier inserts then or are they yeah, the inserts and I made the wooden like the other person that, okay. and they're still question. they're still pulling feet even if you hand feed it and limit how much they're getting they're pulling it out and wasting it well I probably don't limit them enough <laughs> maybe uh I you know I I've been a little bit so anyway I, but I've been using second cutting alfalfa mostly alfalfa with a little bit of uh grass in it not too much and the guy right. I get it from yeah so they got so anyway it. yeah and I do know I did make a, a feeders out of cattle panels similar to the to the um uh premier one panel yep. and it works well in some ways but there is a lot of wastage but I'm yep. I'm using local for that I'm using a local lower oh. quality hay on yep. vegetable growing beds and so I'm getting uh, some mulch for next year Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I know those cattle panel style ones, you know, they'll reach into them for a ways and then they'll get to where they drop the lower quality feed down to the bottom. And then the bottoms don't push in like they're supposed to. And, and we have that problem with the catchem feeders a little bit too, but it seems like the catchem feeders, because they can reach it, they'll get down on their knees and clean up along that lower bar until it'll push in and, and move forward to the next bite of hay. So, so we've had pretty good luck with it that way. Todd? Yes. This is Warren. Hey, Warren. Um, I use the same feeders that you do, but what I did last year is I put a couple of pallets down and put plywood on top of the pallet. Yep. And then raised the legs up so they could push them in. And right now they're, they're cleaning up on everything. It's right down to the wood. Okay, good. Yeah, I've, I've seen people do that. I've seen people put four by fours underneath them, um, wooden posts, anything to get them, especially if you're on mud or on, you know, on, on soil where it gets a little wet and damp around them. Um, and then I always encourage people that if you can, if you're using a, an earthen yard like that, you know, when you, when you get done with one bale, put them in a different location the next time and let that area dry out a little bit. Um, you know, just because, it, you know, as, as you're, you know, they just stand there and, and work it down more and more and more, and then your feeders struggle to work. And then it gets to where they, those legs free down, freeze down, and when you need to get them out, you got to use a skid loader or something or tractor to pull them up out of the mud. So, um, you know, that was when they, when they poured all of the concrete manure retention walls and stuff around here and poured the concrete pads, it made life a little easier around here. But I understand that's an investment that most sheep producers aren't going to be able to afford to make. So, so the using plywood on pallets works good. Um, like I said, anything to get that hay up out of the mud and keep the feeders up a little higher, um, I think will help your feed quality quite a bit. And then having enough sheep that eat them very fairly regularly as well. So uh, we usually have you know 30 to 60 ewes on two round bales, and we'll typically be, be putting two more out about every fifth or sixth day usually. You know, Todd, one of the things I've observed with feeding round bales with the wire panels is uh, initially I always put them on the flat side of the bale, right? You tip the bale up so you have the round side around it wraps real easy. And there is a certain level of waste. Uh, yep. But if you put it on the round side with the flat sides out and put the round and, and wrap it that way, waste seems to go down quite a bit more because of how they have to pull that bale apart. You know, that yep. round bale is made in layers. Uh, yep. And when you stand it up, they just fall. Uh, but when they have to, are forced to pull it out, and this is just an observation, I haven't scraped all it up and weighed it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, that would be an interesting comparison to do someday, um, uh, putting out bales that way and, and, and scraping up the waste and see which one had better consumption. Yep. No, that's, that's something that, you know, if you look at the way our, our feeders work, uh, we set them with the, 
essentially the wall, the flat side of the round bales down. So not the, not the ends, but the side that the bale sits on out in the row, you know, we set that down on the concrete and then just sit, stick those feeders. So they're eating, you know, for a while they can get on the ends on the, on the two ends, but the way those catch, catch them feeders are designed, they're pushing in towards the rounded side of the bale. So, so yeah, like you said, they're eating off of the layers and not off of the ends and not eating into the core of that bale. You know, you set a bale down without any kind of, you know, feeder or even one of the old cattle round bale feeders, you know, those usually crawl up in there and they'll eat right into the core of that to where I've seen sheep die because of it because the bale, the top of the bale collapses on them and suffocates them. So, uh, so yeah, I like it to where they're eating in, eating in from the sides. I'm like Eugene, I see less waste. Uh, and we see probably less waste with the round bales than the dry square bales because of that reason as well. So they, you know, they probably pull more of the dry stimmy, you know, if the, with the square bales, they probably waste a little bit more because of the way they eat into it. So, you know, another change that we've, it's occurred just because of equipment changes. Uh, and that is my bale, not my baler, my, my guy that does baling um, has a, a silage baler uh, and it has knives in it. Yep. Uh, which is now it's, it's kind of pre-processing the bale and it's cutting it into, I think about a, a four or six inch slice. Uh, I mean, each, each, uh, uh, stem and the late waste with that has also gone down dramatically compared to really long fiber, which they can pull the whole thing out. Now they can only pull out small pieces and it's a mouthful. Right. Not everybody yeah. may have access to those types of bales, but if you do, um, you know, I, I find it, uh, helpful. Yep. So we are recording this and, uh, when we're done, uh, give us about a week or so, and, uh, this will be posted. And if you registered, you will get a note, uh, when it's uh, posted and available. Uh, so a couple people had sent me some chats that they were interested in sharing that and, uh, once it's available, you'd be free to view that again that way or share that link on to other people as we go. Uh, we're not seeing a whole lot of new chats uh, or questions come into the uh, uh, chat box. Um, certainly we can stay on for a few more minutes if people would like or would have some more questions that they'd like to talk about as far as uh, feeding. And yeah, definitely don't want to stop any questions, keep them coming. But um, I just want to thank you too. We didn't get a chance to say thanks for joining us tonight. And also thanks to Todd. I know you got a lot of different duties. So um, thank, thanks for answering when we called you again. <laughs> not a problem, not a problem. It's quiet. It's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we look what, forward what, to seeing everyone next month. Well, you know what? One of uh, 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 one of the things I think that has worked well um, for us is. Um, you know, if we've got good hay available, that's the number one, and it meets the nutritional needs, we can limit feed hay. You know, as long as you're matching the protein and energy intake, um, you know, they don't have to eat until they're full, as long as they're getting right. adequate nutrition. Right. And actually, if you limit intake in that regard, you'll see waste go way down. Uh, they'll, they'll clean up everything just because they're looking for a little bit of that room and fill. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is um, if we're purchasing hay, uh, hay is, in my opinion, because I purchase hay rather expensive right now, um, uh, uh, I'd like your deal, Todd. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, we can replace two pounds of hay with a pound of corn. And, and so yep. a lot of times corn can be cheaper, uh, even though I like forages, I want to feed forages, I know they're ruminants, 
but in the end, it's an economic decision that uh, instead of having to feed four pounds of hay a day, I could feed two pounds of hay a day with one pound of corn and meet those nutritional requirements of that you, uh, especially a dry you. Yep. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, so just something to keep in mind, uh, especially if you're in a, in a hay deficit area or a, an area with a lot of livestock and not a lot, a lot of hay, like I am here in Southwest Wisconsin, we tend to be pretty, pretty expensive uh, because of, of, of the livestock and dairy demand out here. There is a question here from Sandy on sampling pasture. Uh, well, you have to get a snow shovel and uh, <laughs> scrape that aside. Uh, but no, I'm sorry, Sandy. Uh, we can sample pasture. Uh, it's a little different than uh, doing a forage sample. Obviously, we can't use a soil or a forage probe like Ryan was demonstrating early on. And what we're doing is we're, st we're, we're still grabbing uh, about a subsample or you know, a, a series of about 10 to 12 subsamples and mixing that all together and sending that in for analysis. But there, there's two ways to do that. Uh, what I recommend for a pasture is to try and grab a, a, a handful, uh, just like a, a sheep would, and tear it at about the height that the sheep are grazing your forage. So you're getting a sample of what uh, the sheep are actually consuming, or the cows, or whatever else you might be grazing, or, or goats. Uh, and take, do that about 10 times across the field uh, that they're in and send that to the lab. It's the same analysis. You'll just get a higher uh, uh, moisture content because it's, it's, it's green forage. And uh, 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 that'll give you an indication of what it was on the day that you sampled. Now, pasture, because it's growing daily, is gonna change. So that's always kind of a look back at what happened. Hay in the barn is it's not gonna get any better. Uh, it might get worse if it's outside, but it's kind of fixed a fixed point in time. Uh, but it's good to, have an idea about the pasture quality that's out there. Most of the time, if we've got good quality pasture, we're going to meet most of those nutritional needs other than maybe a lactating you raising triplets might be a little bit hard to do on pasture. Probably the biggest thing, the biggest advantage of just testing pastures is looking at your mineral making sure that your mineral supplements you're giving those use in the summertime is adequate. Right, and, and as far as that's probably the and because they're working hard, especially if they're lactating ewes. Now we can do, the other is to do a scissor clip, which is to cut it at the same height, like a disc bind or a hay bind would. Uh, and it would be what a hay sample might be. Uh, oftentimes uh, a grazed sample is gonna be a little bit higher than a scissor clip sample. Yep. Because we try not to let the sheep have scissors. And let's see, any tips? Uh, our dairy girls production went crazy when we put them on clover grass. Yeah, we we're feeding good hay, but pasture was better. Yep. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I don't sample pastures as much as I used to when I started 25, 30 years ago. Uh, but I did sample a lot earlier on just to kind of train my eye as far as what the quality was out there especially when we're feeding clovers and, and maybe uh, some grass. And, and a lot of times we're quite surprised, especially with some of our fall grasses in, in late August, September, and early October, as far as the quality goes. Uh, and uh, um, in most cases, uh, I would say at least our flock, uh, which probably is spoiled, but uh, they'd much rather have grass and pasture and forages than, than hay. Um, maybe a, a mouthful of dry hay here and there, but, but really, they, they really like to pr pr prefer to, to graze. Now, they'll always like corn. Uh, and if you're doing uh, uh, dairy does or, or dairy sheep, uh, certainly getting that energy supplement into, uh, uh, into them is a good thing. Uh, but, but good quality pasture almost always is, is better than hay. Okay, well, let's see. We're at uh, 
Uh, about uh, 10 to 9 uh, of the 14, or is it all of us extension types? Or we have a still, I, don't, I can't see my uh, participant list. Oh, as long as you guys are just yawning. Uh, Go ahead, Warren. What I, what I said before about the pellets and the plywood on top, as you know, I feed under a, a canopy as such. And what I did to start with is I put down three quarter inch gravel first. So I don't have the problem with the feet freezing to the ground, but it is a little bit more extreme than a lot of people would do. Yep. Yeah. yeah, freezing down in the wintertime can be the biggest issue with those collapsible feeders and trying to get them to come apart and, and get them out of the way to clean underneath them and set them back up around two more bales can sometimes be a challenge when it's 30 below and you know, blowing snow and everything else. But, um, but so anything you can do to keep them up out of the mud for sure. And, and even on our concrete, you know, as they build up manure and stuff around them, we'll them once. Well, I think if you don't need me, I'm going to sign off and go finish my dinner. <laughs> Check and see if my kids got their chores done. Okay. Yep. Well, Todd, appreciate your help again this evening. I think and I'll see uh, everybody. I think I'm on next month too. I, so. I believe you're going to show us uh, some lambing tips and tricks here uh, in a hopefully month. Hopefully we'll, hopefully we'll have used lamb and I don't have very many scheduled for January, but we should have a few. So. Okay. Well, if, if it's, if it's like how things go here, it'll be a really cold night with a stiff wind and everybody will lamb for us on the 20th, right? That'll be okay. I'm I'm at a heated, you know, heated lemon barn. I can, at least I can get into. The outside isn't very warm when it's blowing like that, but the rest of it'll be okay. So, okay. I'm kind of spoiled. I'll admit it. I have good facilities. So, so um, looks like people are continuing to drop off. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording.